Welcome to the Covert Shores Guide to AI Peace Submarines. This is my second video for YouTube. Like the first one, it's going to be unscripted. After I released the first one, I asked my Twitter followers what I should talk about next, and AIP was a clear winner. So this is that video. I think there's quite a few misconceptions about AIP, so hopefully this will clear some things up. Start by looking at the target. Aircraft carriers are the most powerful warships afloat, and a lot is invested into defending them. However, they have a natural predator. Uh, obviously, the submarine is particularly good at sinking warships. That's what it does. And even the most basic submarine is still an apex predator um, against warships. However, in 2005-2007, off San Diego, San Diego um, the US Navy exercised an aircraft carrier, the USS Ronald Reagan, against a particular submarine, and the submarine was able to sink the, the aircraft carrier several times. Obviously, it's only simulated attacks, but it's a bit of a wake-up call. There was a reason why the US Navy was particularly interested in exercising against this particular submarine, and that's because it had a new type of power plant called Air Independent Power, AIP. That submarine was Swedish, it was a Gotland class, HMS Gotland, in fact, and it was leased to the US Navy for a couple of years. So what is this AIP that the submarine had? In really simple terms, it is an, power, an extra power plant that a submarine has, which is independent of the air to operate. And you know, typically submarines have diesel engines, which require air from the surface to, to run. AIP is something that doesn't require air to surface. That's why it's called air independent. Submarine doesn't have to surface to run it. How did we get here? Let's have a real brief history of AIP. Back during World War II and, and before, submarines operated mostly on the surface and only submerged um, when under attack or needing to be particularly stealthy. The problem was that the submarines were relatively slow when they were when they were submerged. They were running on batteries only, and and they weren't fast enough to escape the uh, the threat. Um, ships with with sonar could identify the submarine, and because the submarine was so slow, they could drop jet charges on it. So the idea came about that if a submarine could be much faster underwater, it would be better able to escape. Um, when it was being attacked. Germany um, experimented extensively with this with the uh, hydrogen peroxide um, engines. And although none were ever fully entering service um, as regular submarines, there were serious plans to. Um, this would have meant that submarines would have to spend less time on the surface, um, potentially uh, making them less detectable. Also, when they were submerged and trying to escape, they could go much faster. After World War II, um, the, the victorious powers started experimenting with the same technology, essentially the same German um, technology. In the Royal Navy, HMS Explorer and uh, two Explorer class submarines actually were built. They're full size submarines, as you can see from the photo. In the US, a single USS X1 was built that had hydrogen peroxide system and in Russia submarines such as the whale class had hydrogen peroxide system the same same German technology again. There was a time in the 50s when this looked like it really was the future of submarines but there was a major a major challenge safety. Hydrogen peroxide was very volatile and in certain circumstances it would explode and could be potentially fatal. Um, HMS Explorer was jokingly known as HMS Exploder um, USS X1 did suffer an explosion at one point and was later re-engined without hydrogen peroxide. Similarly, the whale class submarine, we know that suffered an explosion, although details are pretty sparse. So the technology is not without its challenges, but the bigger threat was nuclear power. Um, also at the same time in the 50s, the first nuclear submarines were being built. U uh, USS Nautilus you know, famously underway on nuclear power in, in January 1955. Once it became clear that nuclear power was viable, it offered all the same advantages and more than um, uh, hydrogen peroxide submarines. So the main powers went to nuclear powered submarines and AIP largely was 
forgotten, let's say. Not completely forgotten though, and in Russia particularly, there was still research being done, some submarines. In the West, um, people started to look to AIP in the 80s, and in 1988, a Swedish submarine was cut in half and an AIP module inserted, and then it was put to back together. And this was the first modern AIP. I'll make a distinction between modern and, uh, and the historic World War II and 1950s AIP because there is an important difference. In the 50s, AIP was really about speed, whereas in the 80s, is about stealth. To see why that is, why, why modern AIP makes submarines more stealthy, let's first look at a, a non-AIP non submarine. It has an electric motor to run the screw or propeller, which drives it along, and that is supplied with energy from storage batteries. Those batteries will go flat over time and need recharging. To recharge them, it has to come to a surface and run its diesel engines. These are used to generate electricity, which then recharges the batteries. Um, while it's at, at or on the surface, it's going to be more vulnerable to detection. AIP still has the same batteries and an electric motor, but it additionally has some form of power plant which can generate electricity to run the electric motor without coming to the surface. So as an alternative to the batteries. This means that as long as that, if that power source is lasting, the submarine doesn't have to snorkel to, to run its diesel engine. So it goes much longer underwater. Um, typically a couple of weeks is, is the, the target for practical target for AIP submarines. So whereas a non-AIP submarine is surfacing every few days to recharge its batteries, an AIP submarine doesn't have to service for several weeks. This makes it much more survival, much more stealthy. However, the AIP is rarely used to actually recharge the batteries. That's a popular misconception. You often hear it uh, said or, or written that AIP allows the submarine to charge its batteries without going to Paris to, um, without snorkeling, so without getting air from the outside. It's possible, but it's not normal because it's less efficient. They simply use the AIP to generate electricity to run the electric motor. It's more efficient than putting it into batteries first and then run an electric motor off those. There are occasions where you could use it to run the, to recharge the batteries. For example, if the captain perceives that there's going to be a, a need to make a very high speed dash underwater, the batteries provide much more power. They're the one what he's going to use, but they need to be recharged. So it might use the AIP just to top up the batteries. It's less efficient overall, but it, could be tactically advantageous. Also, because the AIP isn't powerful enough to recharge the batteries in the normal way, AIP submarines still have a diesel generator. They still have the diesel engines and they still have to snorkel to run those diesel engines periodically, much less frequently than a non-AIP submarine, but it doesn't do away with that, that whole process. I've already used this term Accidentally, we could normally call AIP air independent propulsion. However, I am in the habit of calling it air independent power. There is a subtle difference. Air independent propulsion is when you use the AIP to drive the propeller directly. That's what was happening in the 1950s when speed was the goal. It's much more efficient. But modern AIP is applied in such a way that it generates electricity which then is driven an elect driving electric motor. So it's powering rather than driving. That's the difference. Um, air independent power makes much more sense in the modern context. Um, I'm not the only person using it. Someone else suggested it to me, but we have to admit that most people still call it air independent propulsion, even the people operating or building the submarines. So don't get hung up on the difference. But that is that is what the difference is, and I will I generally use air independent power. So apologies if it confuses anyone. What are the limitations of AIP? Because it's not just all wonderful and all perfect. The main one that I see is that it has limited uh, power. AIP is generally not as not as powerful as the batteries. That's why they still have batteries on these submarines. Um, it's not as powerful as diesel engines, that's why they don't use it to recharge the batteries so often. 
Um, and it's definitely nowhere near as powerful as a nuclear power plant in practice. So it uses it all, this limited amount of power um, goes to a lot of things. As well as driving the submarine along, there's also something called hotel load. This is all the other things on the submarine that take up power. Um, sonar and communications and related sort of activities are a major one. Um, if you want really powerful sonar on your on your submarine, as well as the actual power used to listen or to, to transmit an active sonar, there's also the power used to process the signal. And you need computer rooms, which are environmentally controlled and things like this. If you're going to put quantum computing on, on your submarine, you've got to think about the power again, etc. So that is a major limitation. And it's one of the reasons why non-nuclear submarines in general have less powerful sonar than the nuclear ones. Also supporting life, the crew, they take lots of energy, um, refrigerators, things like that, um, environmental control, and so on. And there's plenty of machinery on the submarine that is eating into the, the power requirements. It can be very basic things like, like um, hoisting masts and things like that. So you've got a limited amount of power and it's not only being used to propel the submarine. And therefore, when a submarine is using AIP, it's generally going very slow, um, typically um, you know, less than 10 knots. So numbers are quite sensitive, but it's, it's, it's slow. And a submarine can go much faster when it's using its batteries because they have more, more charge, certainly initially. Um, and again, if it's using diesel engines, it can go faster. Another limitation which you, you don't hear talked about very much at all is that AIP submarines may still need to ventilate from time to time. Depending on the system, how frequently. In general, AIP systems, the latest ones, are trying to find ways to allow the crew to make, keep the air breathable for the crew for much, much longer. Um, however, there's generally not enough power to do it the way that, say, a nuclear submarine does it. So the submarine still has to surface from time to time every few days to ventilate. Um, I say it depends on the exact submarine. And you don't hear this written about very much. So AIP submarines can go much longer between snorting to recharge the batteries, but they do still have to occasionally surface or come near the surface to get air um, for other purposes, just to ventilate the submarine. Um, like I say, it's important to, to realize that some AIP systems are trying to solve this problem. And so we'll, we'll do away with this risk. So what are the pros and cons in summary? Against a non-AIP submarine, diesel electric submarine, so the, the main competition, the, long, the longer um, time between snorkeling does make it more stealthy. However, on the downside, it's going to be more expensive and more complex. The cost isn't just the actual system itself, it's also supplying it with liquid oxygen or whatever other um, chemicals it needs. And the complexity you know, obviously impacts um, training, maintenance, and so on. There's no doubt, you know, however good these AIP systems are, and they're quite good, um, at the end of the day, a submarine with AIP is going to be inherently more expensive and more complex than the same submarine without. Against nuclear power, it's a bit, a bit harder to say. They're obviously cheaper, and they are more stealthy in some situations. This is inherent to to non-AIP diesel electric submarines as well. Um, in shallow waters, in their optimum environment, they can do things such as sit on the sea floor and turn as many systems off as possible and then just use their batteries. They're very, very quiet when they're doing that. Um, but on the downside, they have much less power. Again, this is true of all diesel electric submarines. Um, they're not as stealthy in longer missions or deeper water. Um, nuclear submarines are very stealthy, modern ones. And because they don't have to surface at all um, for months on end, they are much more stealthy generally. The AIP submarines are much more slow. Um, and also with the, with the speed, nuclear submarines can go not just faster, but they can go faster for sustained periods of time. Whereas if a non-nuclear submarine wants to go very fast, it's going to use its batteries up very quickly. So it's for a short uh, period of time. Um, also, the AIP submarine, because of its less power, they're generally going to be much smaller, and that means fewer weapons. Um, the latest and best 
um, nuclear submarines generally are carrying, let's say, 40 torpedoes or more. Um, Non-nuclear submarines, whether ARP or not, are approaching the 20 torpedo sort of weapons load. Let's talk about some examples. And actually, we'll start with Sweden, because that's where we started the story. The latest version is the A26. This is my unofficial um, cutaway of it, drawn in MS Paint, like all my cutaways, if, if anyone's interested. Um, it has three Stirling engines. These are um, a, a special type of engine. Look them up. Um, the mechanics are really interesting. They use the, the heat temperature um, differences to drive a piston, um, and uh, they generate electricity that way. The modern ones are quite compact and very efficient. They are fueled with liquid oxygen and diesel. The diesel stored in the way liquid oxygen requires very large tanks. We call these LOX, L-O-X. This is common to most, if not all, AIP systems. Liquid oxygen is a common thing. Another type of AIP submarine that uses a different type of propulsion or power plant rather is the Type 2, 212A, which was jointly developed by Germany and Italy. Again, my unofficial cutaway from my website, hisarton.com. This submarine has fuel cells. Um, originally, the first generation of these was sort of 34 kilowatts each, but now they're 120 kilowatts, so they have fewer of them. Um, just like the the Stirling engine AIP, they still require liquid oxygen. So there's some very large liquid oxygen tanks. The size of those tanks will um, ultimately influence the, the endurance it can be run at. Bored and slowly offloaded. Some AIP, or rather some fuel cells do not require this. I'm thinking particularly the French and Spanish varieties. Um, but you often see hydrogen flasks associated with fuel cell submarines. So which countries are making AIP? Sweden is making a sterling generator type. Germany is making the fuel cell type. France is also making fuel cells. Historically, they invented a type called Mesmer, which used a different, a different process. Now they're, they're concentrated on fuel cells. Um, very interesting technology there. China is working on... Um, well, for sure, sterling generators. I would guess they're working on other types too, but we don't have any clear um, uh, confirmation of them putting other types of AIP in submarines. China, by the way, is the large, world's largest operator of, of AIP submarines. Spain is building us submarines with fuel cell AIP, their own type of fuel cell again, using bioethanol, very interesting technology. Um, and there's a few other countries that build AIP submarines, but not necessarily with their own AIP. Um, Japan is famous for its AIP submarines, but they're using sterling generators based on the Swedish model. South Korea and Turkey are both building AIP submarines, but using the German fuel cell technology. Um, there's a couple of interesting ones. Italy, for its large submarines, uses German fuel cell technology. It joint developed the 212A class submarine. However, there are several manufacturers in Italy who specialize in special forces submarines who are very secretive about it, but I would speculate might have some interesting AIP solutions and a long history of AIP. Lastly, India is interesting. It's developed its own AIP for um, retrofitting to some uh, French designed submarines. Very interesting system. I think in the future it will adopt other, other types of AIP from other countries. Um, for the, the, the P-75I submarine. It's not just companies building it, them. Obviously, more and more companies are actually operating fuel cell submarines built by other people. Um, the current operators, 12 of them, Sweden, Germany, Italy, China, Japan, Singapore, um, Greece, Turkey, Portugal, South Korea, Israel, and Pakistan. Pakistan is interesting because their submarines that currently have AIP use the French MESMA system, which I haven't really covered much um, here. It's a historic system. I don't think it's going forward anywhere. Um, future Pakistan Navy submarines will also have AIP, but coming from China, it will be Sterling engine, very likely. Other countries that are joining the club are Spain, as we mentioned, they're building their own AIP submarines, yet to be fitted, um, but it's, it's there. 
India, like I say, is building AIP to put into to retrofit to existing submarines. Norway has adopted German uh, submarine, the uh, 212 CD, that will have AIP. Thailand has bought some AIP submarines off China. They're not yet de delivered. Um, Netherlands is interesting. I'll put TBC here. We don't know what type of submarine they're going to select to replace the Walrus class, but it's a safe bet it will have some form of AIP. Russia is another interesting one. Historically, Russia has been a pioneer and, and early adopter of AIP technologies. And just certainly during the Cold War, maintained you know, some very serious research into it. However, following the Cold War, um, the collapse of the USSR, the financial challenges, they stopped development. And although there have been numerous reports, rumors, designs for AIP submarines, none of them have really been realized. And currently the LADA class appears not to have AIP on it. Um, we'll see um, you know, where they go with that in the future. The last flag I put there is Egypt, it's interesting. They recently purchased some non-AIP submarines from Germany. I think it's a safe bet that they're going to be looking for AIP submarines in the near future. And there are other countries we could mention as well. Um, Indonesia, Philippines are looking for submarines and like, you know, have some AIP choices out there. So there will be more and more countries with AIP. What are the emerging trends? There's a couple I want to highlight. The first one is lithium ion batteries or lithium based technology for batteries. Um, Japan is the leader here and has already launched several submarines that have um, lithium based batteries some of them have actually had the aip removed so the lithium batteries are so good that they no longer require um, aip that's a promise of lithium battery technology and possibly it will make overall make AIP less attractive or less, less differentiating. However, it's important to say that, AI, that uh, lithium battery technology comes with its own risks. There's a lot of safety concerns. Obviously, Japan feel that they've solved this. I think you know uh, South Korea and Italy are also um, stated to have a, a plans to use lithium battery technology. They must have solved this, but it's something that's going to be a barrier to countries just you know, you can't just take a current submarine, stick lithium batteries in it and, and go away. There's a lot of safety considerations you have to overcome. However, it's not the end of AIP for sure. And one interesting thing is that in parallel now, sub, you know, lots of countries who build submarines are looking at very large uncrewed underwater vehicles, XL UVs um, would be a typical name. Some of those in the future might have AIP. This is a, a a concept graphic from Siemens in Germany, suggesting a version of their, their fuel cell AI, uh, AIP for very large uncrewed underwater vehicles. I think we'll see more of this. So that concludes what I wanted to talk about for AIP. Hopefully you found it interesting. Like I said, it was unscripted, that probably very obvious at times, but hopefully still, um, still worth watching. If you liked it, please do subscribe. Please do hit the like button and share it this is not a monetized channel you know i don't know how many views it'll get so so please um do share if you like and in the comments um give me any encouragement or ideas corrections very welcome um thank you for listening